Isaiah chapter 17. This is about the burden of Damascus. And it goes along with chapter 7 where Syria and Israel are a confederate. And the burden of Damascus is the prophecy concerning Damascus, what Isaiah has on his chest. He's got to get it off his chest about Damascus. And he says, the burden of Damascus, behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. Imagine going through your city, your town, wherever you're at. Maybe you got historical buildings in it, nice buildings. You've always grew up here. You've seen these same buildings your whole life. One of these days, it's going to become a ruinous heap. It, in your mind, you think, well, this is going to be here forever. No, one day it's going to become a ruinous heap. It's going to be demolished. Uh, Damascus is the capital of Syria. It was defeated in 2 Kings 16, 7 through 9, but it never stopped being a city. You actually end up seeing the Apostle Paul get saved on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9. And that goes to show you that God can bring something good out of a bad place. God can bring something good out of a bad thing. But the Apostle Paul, he got saved on the road to Damascus. That's probably what it's known the most for. Uh, if you're a Bible believer, that's probably what you know it. The most for how you're the most familiar with it. That that's where Paul got saved on the road to Damascus. That's what I think of when I hear the word. But this burden of Damascus, the Lord says He's going to make it a ruinous heap. It's going to get decayed, demolished, leveled. It says the cities of Aroa are forsaken; they shall be for flocks which shall lie down, and none shall make them afraid. So, once it gets demolished, leveled, the animals are going to move in, and they're going to live in there peace, peaceably. The cities of Aurora are forsaken, and it's going to be for flocks. Look at Isaiah 27.10. Isaiah 27 and verse 10. It says, Yet the defense city shall be desolate, and the habitation forsaken, and left like a wilderness. There shall the calf feed, and there shall he lie down, and consume the branches thereof. You see, once a place that doesn't have people in it, and it's been demolished and torn down, the animals start moving in and living there. Even like when you leave your house for a while, you go on vacation, you come back and there's spider webs and some critters have started to move in. Like, I know when I go on vacation and I come back home, there's spider webs everywhere outside and there's rabbits running around all over the yard. They've been used to there not being any people there, so they've just lived up in there without fear. You know, the kid's trampoline's got spider webs on it. Their swing set has got spider webs on it because they've not been around to knock them all down, you see. So the cities of Aurora are forsaken. They shall be for flocks, which shall lie down, and none shall make them afraid. The fortress also shall seize from Ephraim. Now, Ephraim, when it's talking about Ephraim, that's talking about the northern kingdom. And, you know, I've told you about how Israel split after Rehoboam. Rehoboam, he sided with the young men that he grew up with and took their advice. And it made him, uh, it caused the kingdom to split. So you have King, Je King Jeroboam with the northern kingdom, the ten tribes, and then you got Rehoboam with the southern kingdom, the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin. So it's a split in the kingdom. 
Now, when it talks about Ephraim, it's talking about the northern kingdom, Israel. The northern kingdom is referred to as Israel, and it's referred to as Ephraim. The southern kingdom is referred to as Judah. So, But it says, The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim, and the kingdom from Damascus, and the remnant of Syria. They shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. So remember, Ephraim is the northern kingdom, and Damascus is the capital of Syria, and the northern kingdom and Syria were confederate with each other, and they were against Judah. But look what it says. They shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. Well, what's going to happen to the glory of the children of it with the glory of the children of Israel? Look at verse 4. In that day it shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. They're going to be made thin and they're going to wax lean. Only a remnant is going to survive. Only a remnant of Syria is going to survive. So that when it says made thin and wax lean, that's referring to the people. There's going to be less of them. It's not talking about they go on a good diet and they are made thin and wax lean. It's talking about a bunch of them is going to die and it's just only going to be a remnant that survives. And you know that story over there in Genesis 41 where Pharaoh has that dream with the lean cattle and the fat cattle and all that. Look at Genesis 41, 2 through 3. It says, And behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kind and fat-fleshed, and they fed in a meadow. And behold, seven other kind came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean-fleshed, and stood by the kind upon the brink of the river. That's what that reminds me of. And that's talking about famine over there. But here, it's, 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 all, it's talking about it, and it's saying, Made thin, and the fatness of the flesh shall wax lean. It's talking about the people getting uh, demolished and there's only a remnant that survives. And verse 5 says, And it shall be as when the harvestman gathereth the corn and reapeth the ears with his arm. And it shall be as he that gathereth ears in the valley of Rephaim. So it shall be as when the harvestman goes out and gathers corn and he just reaps the ears with his arm. Meaning, you know, there's so few left that he can, he can gather them with his arms, you see. That's how many is going to be left. Just a very few. Just a very small remnant. Enough that a man could go in there and just gather them with his arm. It says in verse 6, Yet gleaning grapes shall be left in it. Just the gleanings. Just enough to glean. As the shaking of an olive tree, like you go shake, up an, shake an olive tree, and two, only two or three berries in the top of the uppermost bough, that's all you get. Two or three berries fall out because so many have been taken away. Four or five in the outmost fruitful branches thereof, saith the Lord God of Israel. So just gleaning grapes, just two or three berries fall out. Just four or five in the outmost fruit, fruitful branches. So this is referring to the remnant of Syria after their destruction. You're only going to find a few. So it said in verse 5 there, it says, And it shall be as when the harvestman gathereth the corn, and reapeth the ears with his arm. And it shall be as he that gathereth ears in the valley of Rephaim. Now you probably remember Rephaim. Rephaim is... The place where David won that great victory over the Philistines. And here the destruction of Damascus will be as easy and as thorough as a wheat harvest. It says in verse 7, At that day shall a man look to his maker. He's going to look to his maker. You know that saying, prepare to meet your maker. And his eyes shall have respect to the Holy One of Israel. You better prepare to meet your maker. 
that's the Lord. And somehow people think they know more than their maker. Over in uh, Job 4.17, it says, Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Are you prepared to meet your maker? You know, over in Romans it says, Shall this thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? You know, how can we question God, really? How can you question God? How can you think you're more just than your maker? You know, I have people say to me a lot, you know, if God knows we're going to sin and makes us anyway, and then how is that okay? Or they say, if God knows that this person is going to be born with this disease or be born and get slaughtered and raped and whatnot, then why does he allow them to be born? And the, the best answer to that is, uh, shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure than his maker? Are you saying that you know better than God? Are you saying that you're more pure than he is? That's your maker. You need to have respect to your maker and, and realize that even if you don't understand, he's got more sense than you got. You know, somebody says, you know, why does God allow us to be born if he knows we're going to be a sinner? Well, why did you have your kids when you knew they would be a sinner? You see, uh, are you more just than God? You did the same thing yourself. So he says, at that day shall a man look to his maker. He's finally going to look to the right God. And notice, you see that phrase in verse 4, and in that day it shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean. The phrase in that day puts you in a tribulation context. When you see that phrase in that day, it puts you in a tribulation, second coming, millennial context. Then you got verse 7 where it says, at that day, once again, tribulation context, shall a man look to his maker and his eyes shall have respect to the Holy One of Israel. When we get into the millennium, their, their eyes are going to have respect to the Holy One of Israel. His eyes are going to look on him who was pierced. Zechariah 12.10. It says, And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. They're going to look on their maker their eyes are going to see him and they're going to have respect to the holy one of israel who's the holy one of israel the lord jesus christ acts 227 over there in acts 227 it says because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption that's the lord jesus christ acts 314 it says but ye denied the holy one and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you. They, he, he's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, preaching the Lord Jesus Christ there. Acts 13, 35. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Talking about the Lord Jesus, not corrupting, but resurrecting on the third day. So the Holy One is the Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to have respect to the Holy One of Israel. Over in Genesis 2.22, it says, And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. You see that? Who made him? The Lord. He took the rib of the man that he had just made and made a woman. They're going to look to that same God one of these days. The same God that made them, made Adam and Eve back there in Genesis 2. That's who they're going to look to. Genesis 5.1, this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day that God created man, in the likeness of God made he him. 
Verse 2, male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. He made them, he named them. He made them male and female, the Bible says. Over in Ecclesiastes 11 and verse 5, it says, As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not all the works of God who maketh all. He makes all. He makes, he makes every man, not just Adam and Eve. He makes every man. Now, he didn't make everybody from the dust of the ground in the sense that he did like Adam. But even, you know, the bones of the child growing in the womb. He's, uh, he's the one that's putting that together, allowing that to have happen. He makes all. And one of these days, they're going to look to their maker. And their eyes are going to have respect to the Holy One of Israel. And he shall not look to the altars, the work of his hands. Neither shall respect that which his fingers have made, either the groves or the images. You see, when they get into the millennium, these people aren't going to be having these altars where they're worshiping false gods. They're not going to be worshiping the work of their hands anymore. Neither shall respect that which his fingers have made. They're going to look to his maker and have respect to the Holy One of Israel. You know, look at your hand. Take your hand and look at it and look at those fingers. Look at those puny hands and fingers. I'm all the time smashing these puny hands and fingers at work and my nails turn black. And they stay black for a long time until it falls off. My hands are small. I can't even wear a large glove. I have to get small gloves at work. It's puny. Why would I worship something that these puny hands have made? But that's what people do. They're just worshiping stuff that puny hands have made. But one of these days, they're going to worship the true God. They're not going to respect what their fingers have made. Either the groves, these groves is, the groves in the Bible is wooded areas with, with a bunch of trees where the shadow thereof is good and men love darkness rather than light so they go in those groves and that's where they worship their idols. Or sometimes they'll take one of them trees and cut it down and, and carve a, an image out of that grove and they worship it. Or the, the images. They'll make those images. And they'll worship that image. Just like with the Antichrist, they're going to worship his image. Bow down to him and worship him at an altar. But one of these days, they're not going to do that no more. It says in verse 9, In that day shall his strong cities be as a forsaken bough and an uppermost branch, which they left because of the children of Israel. And there shall be desolation. It's going to be des be made desolate. Nothing inhabiting it. Nothing there. You know, there's places where you go and you're like, I, I hate it here. There's nothing here. There's nothing going on here. And it's kind of depressing and boring. And that's the way this place is going to be. For what reason? Verse 10, Because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation, and thou hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength. Therefore shalt thou plant pleasant plants, and shall set, with, set it with strange slips. They have forgotten the God of thy salvation. You see, the God of your salvation, you have to push out of your mind because there's something that God puts in you that makes you desire Him. So to just completely forget about Him you don't, you're going to have to get to where you don't want to retain him in your knowledge. Like those people in Romans 128. You know, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Psalm 917. There is a desire in man to seek God. So instead of seeking the real God, they find another God. They have to push the real God out of their mind. And they forget about the true God, the Holy One of Israel, who is 
the rock of their strength. They've, and they, he says, and has not been mindful of the rock of thy strength. That's the Lord, the rock. Deuteronomy 32, 31 says, talks about how their rock's not as our rock. Who's our rock? It's the Lord. Second Samuel uh, 22, 32 talks about who is a rock. Save our God. God is the rock. And Psalm 95, 1 it says, O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. And 1 Peter 2, 8, it calls him the stone of stumbling and rock of offense. The Lord Jesus says, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That rock is himself. He's not talking about Peter. He's talking about himself. Upon this rock I'll build my church. He says, because thou hast forgotten the God of thy salvation and hast not been mindful of the rock of thy strength. They don't even want God on their mind. Therefore thou shalt plant pleasant plants and shall set it with strange slips. They're going to be planting stuff and the, the slips are for support. And, you know, they got support from nations and not God. But this also reminds me of what are they going to be doing in the end times? Eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, just living life. And in Luke seven twenty eight, look what the Lord says. He says, likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded. See, they're going to be planting going through the motions of life. You know, you can go through the motions of this life. Eat, get up, you eat, you drink, you get married, you plant, you make money, you buy stuff. But is it well with your soul? A lot of times I just look around and everybody's just going through the motions of life. But is it well with their soul? Are they thinking about eternity? Are they thinking about anything beyond this life? They're just eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, planting, and building. But what have they done with the rock? What have they done with the God of their salvation? What have they done with the Holy One of Israel? Verse 11, In the day shalt thou make thy plant to grow, and in thy morning shalt thou make thy seed to flourish. But the harvest shall be a heap, in the day of grief and of desperate sorrow. You know, like I said, you can go through the motions of life, you can plant, you can grow. But what's going to happen? In the morning. But the harvest shall be a heap in the day of grief and of desperate sorrow. That day's coming. Is it well with your soul? Woe to the multitude of many people which make a noise like the noise of the seas and to the rushing of nations that make a rushing like the rushing of mighty waters. Think of a huge stadium of people screaming and shouting. Sounds like a noise of many waters. Imagine all the armies gathered together, all the nations of the world gathered together against the Lord and against his army. They're making this loud noise with their voice. It sounds like the rushing of many waters. But then the Lord Jesus Christ opens his mouth and his mouth alone Sounds like the rushing of many waters. It says in verse 13, got to watch out for the 13s, the nation shall make, the nation shall rush like the rushing of many waters, but God shall rebuke, rebuke them, and they shall flee far off and shall be chased as the chaff, chaff, chaff of the mountains before the wind and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. Now you see those words like chaff, and whirlwind, they occur over and over in the context of the second coming. You know, the Lord's coming back on a white horse and flaming fire taking vengeance. And Proverbs 10.25 says, As the whirlwind passeth, so is the wicked no more. 
but the righteous as an everlasting foundation. And Isaiah 40, 24, talking about the whirlwind, it says, And the whirlwind shall scatter them, and thou shalt rejoice in the Lord, and shalt glory in the Holy One of Israel. In Isaiah 66, 15, it says, For behold, the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with flames of fire. In Isaiah 40, 24, it says, And they shall wither and the whirlwind shall take them away as stubble. Jeremiah 23, 19, Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord is gone forth in fury. Even a grievous whirlwind, it shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. Jeremiah thirty twenty three. Behold, the whirlwind of the Lord goeth forth with fury, a continuing whirlwind. It shall fall with pain upon the head of the wicked. Yeah, the whirlwind definitely associated with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Isaiah 17, 13, the nations shall rush like the rushing of many waters. They're going to gather together against the Lord Jesus Christ, against Israel. They're going to be making a loud noise with their voice. But God shall rebuke them and they shall flee far off and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains. Remember over in Revelation 6, the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from them that sitteth upon the throne from the face of the Lamb, for the day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? They're going to be running away. They shall flee far off and shall be chased as the chaff of the mountains before the wind and like a rolling thing before the whirlwind. Like a thing on the ground that's a tornado is just blowing away. And then verse 14, And behold, at even, evening tide trouble, and before the morning he is not. So at evening tide they're in trouble, and then in the morning he's not. So what's, the second coming also like it's like the morning the sun of righteousness arises and it says this is the portion of them that spoil us and the lot of them that rob us this is what's coming to those who mess with israel this is the consequence of those who go against israel but that's isaiah 17 